Hello. There. Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm already live. It worked so well this week. How is everyone? Not here. <laughs> oh, 19 people are here. How are you doing, people? 19 people. It's so good to have you here. Marion, hello. Tracy, hello. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wrong thing. Lorraine and Nancy and all the peoples and Elizabeth and everybody is here. How are you doing, Judith and another Elizabeth and Nancy and Shelly and uh, Anne and all of you? It's so great to see you. I can't see you. It's a metaphor. Like the old joke. I see, said the blind man as he picked up his hammer and saw. Hi, Katie. Hi, Eileen. Hi, Christine. Oh, we have over 100 people. So I'm going to start, guys. I'm going to start. First, I want to welcome you all to the gathering room. I am, you will never guess, Martha Beck. Yes, I am. Who? Just look it up. Okay, so I just want to welcome you all here again. And today I'm going to talk for a while. Yes, I am. And, and I may or may not take questions afterward, but I have a few things to say. And I have summed it up with the title, Beyond the Barricades. Um, if you've seen the famous Broadway musical, Les Miserables, it's, uh, there's a subplot, or maybe it's the central plot, I was never sure, where a bunch of angry young men set up a barricade and then they all fight and die on it. And I'm never quite sure, and I've seen it several times, why or what they're doing. But there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of cheering and there's a lot of intensity, and I thought it was an appropriate title to talk about for reasons you may imagine this week. So first of all, but let's start in a different place. Let's start where the gathering room actually started. And that is in my lifelong obsession with something I call the transformation of consciousness. Something that I have been waiting for, looking forward to, expecting, knowing was about to happen my entire life. As you know, if you've tuned in to anything I've said or written or done in my whole life, I am obsessed with this transformation of consciousness. I, I didn't know what it was when I was a child, when I was an adolescent, but as an adult, after many, many years of study and, and contemplation, I came to believe that it is what's called enlightenment in the Asian countries. And it's a specific brain state. So it's not just enlightenment as in, oh, I read a good book and it really enlightened me. No, this is a fundamental change in the state of the brain. I'll talk more about the specific changes a little bit later because they are real and have now been measured and observed. But for long, long, long centuries in many parts of the world, people have recognized that certain individuals go through a shift where they no longer experience psychological suffering that they live in a state of peace, joy, bliss, and a lot of words that seem to begin with C, courage, calm, compassion, um, curiosity, these lovely words that describe the human psyche after ego is gone and only the divine spark remains, but one is, isn't dead yet. So I've been obsessed with this forever and you guys know about it, I talk about it all the time. And you also may know that as somebody schooled in sociology a bit, I have been obsessed for a long time with the question, what would society look like if everyone in it were enlightened? What would happen if a transformation of consciousness spread like a virus, infected everyone on earth, and flipped us out of our state of ego and grasping into a state of serenity and joy, curiosity, calm, confident compassion. And you may also know that a long time ago, I thought, hmm, not that long ago, about 10 years ago, I thought, okay, the society we have now, shaped like a pyramid, it's been that way ever since the dawn of agrarian culture and probably before that, we just don't have written records. 
but um, hunter-gatherer societies seem to be more flat, more e egalitarian. But in our culture, it's a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid are the people with power, wealth, and status. And they typically crush and oppress the people below them in the pyramid who are exploited to give them power, wealth, and status. You have to have it over someone. You have to have somebody giving you the power, wealth, and status. So that's the pyramid of power has been there. You know, the pyramids of Egypt are sort of a symbol. They've been there for 5,000 years and it's always been that way. But a society of enlightened people, what would that look like, I thought? And I came to the conclusion that it would look like a perfectly still surface of, of water where it's everybody's exactly even, but we're all represented by a stream of water flowing into like raindrops going into the perfect stillness of this fluid pool. And that we would join with it immediately because part of enlightenment is losing the sense of being separate. You blend with everything else, but you create an energy that makes ripples on the surface and those ripples interact. And the um, amount of energy going into your ripples would have to do with the, the intensity and, and scale of pr your presence in the world, your, your ability to connect with the present moment in its absolute reality. Okay, so that's a feature of enlightenment as well. And then I was wondering, how do you get from a pyramid to a pool? Like, I don't understand the mechanism. Wondered about that for a few years and one day realized, oh wait, it's already happening. The pyramid is standing in the pool. So people are start, starting to wake up. There are individuals who are waking up, waking up, waking up. And they, I've been watching Oprah's uh, Super Soul series lately um, because she asked me to do one. We don't know COVID. But anyway, I watched a bunch of them. And it was really interesting how people who didn't know each other, Zen monks who never read the books of a pop psychologist and then that pop psychologist would come on not having read the Zen monk and then somebody else from some other field in the world, some poet, you know, a travel writer, they'd all come on and with unbelievable um, unanimity, they all said we are in the midst of the greatest transformation of human psychology, of human spirit, of human consciousness in the history of our species. So these people were, are all picking up or have known all their lives. What I felt I knew all, all my life, what you might have felt you've known all your life. The other day I did a Q&A call for our Wayfinder coach training and I had we had 50 some people on the screen and I said, raise your hand if, you've, if you're aware or if you've always thought there would be a transformation of human consciousness. Sure enough, about 85% of them raised their hands. And so we're not just feeding off each other. This is, seems to be in some of us. It was born into some of us. And as we move forward toward our own awakening, what happens is that the rigid ego structures that keep us in the pyramid of culture start to dissolve and we become more fluid, we become more clear, we become more absorbent, we become more accepting of other things, we begin to bond with each other seamlessly, the way water just blends. You know, there's no barrier that separates any of us. There's no difference or sense of separation. And as that happens, the two things that disappear when you, in the brain, when one achieves a state of enlightenment is that the part of the brain that sees you as separate from others goes offline. And so does the part of you that feels like you are going to control things by, you know, come hell or high water, I'm going to control everything. That goes away. And so the initial experience of enlightenment for people who've been through it, they report is a state of terror as the self wants to hang on to its identity and its sense of control. And both of those are illusions, but there's, you're still afraid to give them up. And then when they go, it's into, it's in a burst of terror often, and then whew, peace, bliss, calm. You look around and you realize, oh my gosh, I've been living in a dream. I thought, I thought everything was hard and horrible and that violence was inevitable and that death was the end. And now I see that's not so. And I don't just think it's not so, it is observably so. That's what happens when the brain goes through that state. Jill Bolte-Taylor, the Harvard neuroanatomist, calls it taking a step to the right hemisphere. She went through a stroke and experienced the same thing. So what we're looking for in society I thought, 
is not a revolution. We do not need revolution because we've had revolution. We've had revolution after revolution. In fact, revolution just means to turn and turn and turn. I was in, I did research in China right after the cultural revolution where, you know, 30 million people starved to death and then a whole bunch of the survivors killed each other because as I often heard in China, people would sort of cynically say, yeah, under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the other way around. So yes, it was unfair in traditional China. You know, the, the rich oppressed the poor and then they revolted and they flipped it. And now the people who were in power, who were oppressed before were in power and vice versa. And they started oppressing and killing the people below them. So that's a revolution. Man exploits man and then it's the other way around. In a dissolution, what happens is that personal suffering disappears first for an individual. There's a, there's a struggle with the ego. The, the ego tries to hang on to its sense of control, to its sense of separateness. And if we, pers if we completely devote ourselves to awakening, eventually, even through that fear, we sort of break through the barricade and who? Suffering is gone for us and we become fluid and clear. Now, as that happens and we become part of the pool, the pool is a solvent. It dissolves things. So the people around us begin to be affected by our awakening. And where there have been people who awakened in history, you've seen this around them. You see it around Jesus. You see it around Buddha. You see it around Nelson Mandela, um, who I think was awake. Um, I've seen it around the spiritual teacher, Byron Katie. I, I watch people around her, like almost go into a different state of being and lose their sadness, lose their fear, lose their anger and become calm, compassionate, curious, courageous, all of that. So as this happens to us, the society that we're a part of feels us as a solvent and we, it begins to dissolve. Now, I want to talk for a moment about how mindless rage dissolves when we wake up. But that doesn't mean there is never a state of resistance to injustice. We, we lose, we dissolve our mindless rage, but we keep our mindful anger, which is simply a recognition of injustice. So this week, we, for those listening to this in the future, to the recording, was the week that we saw rioters try to disrupt the, the uh, processes of the government in the Capitol building in Washington, DC. And we watched people smashing the windows of the Capitol building and parading things through the halls and ripping art off the walls and so on. And I got a lot of calls and emails and texts from people saying, you've got to say something. But they also said, but don't say, don't say the X or you'll make Y people really, really angry. And definitely don't say Y because then the X people will get really, really angry at you. And you can't say both. Oh my gosh, everybody would be angry at you. And if you said Z, it would be even worse, but you can't be silent because then everyone's going to be angry at you. And I sat with this and here's something I heard this week that I believe is true. I heard this from uh, a woman. This is, it, it, he's her 12th. This man is her 12 step sponsor and he happens to be, I know him and he is an African-American man who I believe is fully awake. I think he's actually enlightened. And one thing he told my friend is there are these two voices inside you. And one is your disease, your ego. And the other is the voice of the divine. And they both speak to you in your own voice. They both sound like you, but the voice of the ego will always say, hurry, hurry, hurry. This is very, very urgent. And the voice that is God will always say, take a breath, get steady. There's no rush. Take your time. So that's the first thing I did was like, okay. I mean, there's always a time, there is a time to move in physically. I was very glad when people moved in to break up those demonstration, that demonstration and get some of the violence sort of under control. Um, 
sorry, I was about to make a statement that would have made people X very angry, but I just, I think they move very slowly compared to the way the police force moves when the rioters are, are, have darker skin. There you go. Um, but as people were saying, you, you, you've got to say something about this, but you can't say anything wrong. I thought this is what happens when egos are frightened. This everybody being angry at everybody for everything and it's a mindless attack energy and it comes from a part of the brain called the amygdala and it feels really good to us like i'm going to run in and attack someone on the internet for example just for the sheer joy of attack because i'm angry at what's going on in our nation's capital right now and i want to lash out and it feels good to lash out and as i go into that rage, I can't help but notice that all these people are feeling this mindless rage and the sort of savage joy of just sheer attack. That climate of rage is something that is that belongs to the ego and it creates that flip where people exploit other people and then it flips and the, the other people are exploiting the first group of exploiters. Mindful anger is something very very different it's something that is part of the awakened psyche and i actually made a list of characteristics that compare and contrast the mindful rate the mindless rage of the ego uh, and the mindful anger of the um the enlightened so i am going to read you that list right now hang on so your if you're in a state of egoic rage, your actions are going to be things that increase your anger. So you have a compulsion to do things that make your anger get higher and higher. When you're in a state of mindful anger, you're going to be compelled to do actions that reduce your anger, like being calm, like breathing, like thinking, okay, what actually is justice here? Getting still compassionate, Calm. Just, you know, if you're not the one in the fray, just take a breath. If you're in mindless rage, you're going to see all people as us versus them. If you're in mindful anger, you're going to see all people as connected. So even though you may be very angry at someone, you're still connected to them in some way. You're still both human. Mindless rage avoids new information, doesn't want to hear a thing that goes against its own beliefs already. Mindful anger seeks new information. What, why is this happening and what can we do about it? So it's looking, it's curious. Mindless anger focuses obsessively on a few topics. Mindful anger learns about many topics, is constantly learning. Mindless rage imagines only its own perspective. Mindful anger imagines other perspectives. Mindless anger sees everything as black and white mindful anger sees everything as shades of gray and mindful mindless rage insists on its own infallibility while mindful anger acknowledges that anything it thinks is fallible that it may be wrong so as i, w I went back and i read that list and i thought which one am i in because man a lot of me wanted to go into the mindless rage i gotta tell you but i thought okay if my theory about the transformation of consciousness and creating a just enlightened society is right, then this is what I can do right here, right now. And I want to invite everybody here to do it with me. We can dissolve the cultural pyramid that we've breathed in with our socialization in this particular time and place in history. We can start dissolving that structure in our own minds because it's in there. The bias for inequality, we've breathed, breathed it in from the moment we were born. Racism is right in the crux of American society. The man who wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, owned slaves while he was writing it. That, that contradiction is at the core of the American culture. It's just, it's always been there. And we've all breathed it in. No matter what race, creed, or color we come from, we breathed it in. And part of us, I'm always talking about how there's culture and then there's nature. Nature is what 
mindful, the just mind, not the judgmental mind, but the just mind comes up and says, wait, that cannot be right. Um, it just can't be. And so it starts to go against culture and it dissolves the cultural bias. So we all, if we get really honest with ourselves, say, whoa, that, that's been bred into me and it can't, that cannot be true. And it starts to dissolve. Same thing with sexism. Same thing with cruelty and discrimination against people of all marginalized groups. Same thing about attack for its own sake, even if you're, you're just arguing with your cousin over a dinner table. So we dissolve everything that defends the rigid ego structure that says, I am separate, I am in control, I am angry at you, and I'm going to attack you. We let it melt away, we let it dissolve. And why do we do this? First, we do it to end our own suffering. That is a motivation that you can be sure is pure and true. Nobody wants to suffer. We all want to be happy. And when we dissolve the rigid structures that we've got from our socialization and that we get from partly the biology of being a monkey, frankly, being a social primate, as we dissolve that, our suffering goes away. And I, I'm nowhere near enlightened, but I can tell you I've been crawling toward it for a long time and most of the suffering I used to feel genuinely is gone. I can tell you that, that most of my life I spent in a state that is 99% happier than I used to be for the first three years of my life. So we do it to avoid suffering. We move away from our own pain. What could be more motivating than that? But we know that we're gonna lose the perception of ourselves as separate and alone. And we're gonna lose the ability to see others as completely unlike ourselves. We're going to end up feeling curious, compassionate, calm, courageous. And eventually we'll start to become that fluid, open thing that flows together with people and begins to dissolve their rigidity. And how do we do it? We do it by acting on love in the moment. Um, the, the yogi that I always quote just said in a lecture, just sort of it, when I was listening, I memorized it on the spot. I exist in continuous creative response to whatever is present. So his whole job was to try to be awake himself and then moment to moment to moment to moment respond in love to whatever he was seeing in front of him. And as you do this, as you lose the suffering that you have felt, other people will start to come out of their suffering and into their form of love. Not your form of love, not your dogma, not your preaching from the rooftops, but their own truth, their own experience of love. So as this happened, this has been happening already. And one thing I've always known is that the part of the pyramid that dissolves the first, you can see this, I think Rose said she was going to link to this uh, video I made where I actually built a pyramid out of sugar cubes and put it in a pool of water and it dissolves sure enough from the bottom up and the bottom things dissolve the quickest. In a social structure, the oppressed are more likely to dissolve quickly because they have more incentive to be free from pain, they're experiencing much more pain and they get a lot less ego gratification from the system. So I'm not saying that every oppressed person is enlightened, but I am saying that if you are part of an oppressed group, your social conditions and your the conditions of your life are much more likely to result in your quick awakening than if you were higher in the pyramid. It's just the way the pressures of the world are come to us. So when I watched the, that mob swarming the capital. What I saw was a level of the pyramid that was in the upper part, feeling the dissolution coming up, right? Feeling that this is already happening, that the awakened society is already beginning all around us. The pandemic gave us time to dissolve a lot of our ego structures. My daughter who came to visit over Christmas after getting quarantined and tested and everything. She said, it's interesting during the pandemic, people are getting less attached to their gender identities because we don't have to go out and perform gender. We don't have to go out and act like a man or a woman or a gay person or trans person or whatever is supposed to act. We actually 
because we're sort of socially distancing, we ha- we get to figure out who we are. And as Glennon Doyle says, it's like sexual identity is is water. The sexual, uh, no, sexuality is water. Sexual identity in the culture is a glass. It's another form of saying that the culture is rigid, but the reality is fluid and clear. So people are becoming fluid and clear in terms of their gender. And I also think that we're losing a lot of the cultural assumptions that we've had about a lot of things about how many clothes we need, about how valuable time with our friends really is, about how valuable our pets are, you know, about what really makes us happy. The pandemic has given us an opportunity to dissolve. And the way it works in the brain when some of your assumptions die away is that here are the neuron synapses all connected and they literally start to die off. There's a kind of withering and As you think new thoughts, those get wired in place instead. So the transformation has already been underway. And as those people were swarming up the Capitol building, I thought it's right at their toes. This has been rising so silently, so gently, so softly, so ineluctably, because awakening does not shatter things. It does not attack things. It does not scream horrible, hateful things. It dissolves into love and then it dissolves anything that is not love around it and you don't even know it's happening until it's already happened so what what is going on i think is that what we saw is evidence that the transformation of consciousness is getting more and more widespread in society and that it's come up the pyramid quite away and that the rigid structures of power and ego are afraid of their own dissolution because it's coming because when you set your course to wake up the the rigid mindless rage ego structures the biases the isms the the separation the rejection of other people it is doomed because it is not truth it is not love it is not who we really are so i know that by saying all these things I might have offended every single one of you. I I try not to. I certainly don't want to add to your suffering or upset anyone in any way that, that is never ever part of my intention. However, right now things are so stirred up that I know you might be feeling really raw and hurting for a thousand different reasons, whoever you are, wherever you are. There's so much to be frightened of right now for the part of us that gets frightened. And so if you disagree with me and if you're angry at me right now for saying this, for not saying something that you wish I'd said, I really get it. I really understand. And I promise you, I'll be looking, I'll be studying myself for flaws and for errors as I go forward every single day. Am I, am I, Am I enlightened? No, I almost said not a chance, but then I stopped because I think there is a chance. I think there's a chance for every single one of us. I think that looking at what seems to be so much bad news, we can decide to say this is evidence that the transformation is happening and that it's spreading widely and that hatred feels the dissolution tickling at its toes and it thinks it wants to run away. It thinks it wants things back the way they were, but it only thinks that because it's lost in an illusion and in fear and in pain. And we want those people to wake up too. If we can all dissolve into that curious, compassionate, creative, calm, confident, part of ourselves into the divinity that is our essential self, we'll look back and say, ah, that was a really bad dream. So glad we're out of that one. So I didn't take any questions today. I just wanted to say what I had to say about this. And I just wanted to finish by saying, I wish every blessing of the universe upon you, whoever you are. Here's to the dissolution. Here's to the transformation of consciousness. Here's to love. Here's to you.
I love you guys. I'll see you again next week on the gathering room again.